Awesome. Welcome. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you. I really feel like we're um, we're finishing with a bang. And I yeah. don't know. It was it was very hard for us to get a hold of you. So if you knew if the uh, attendees today knew how hard we had to try <laughs> to get you here today, uh, I'm sure you're going to make it well worth it. So. Um, let me first introduce to everybody Quentin Gent. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yeah, Gent, yeah. Gent. Uh, Gent. Quentin is a second generation urban beekeeper from Versailles, France, who joined his father, Nicholas. His father, Nicholas, is uh, business Beopic for a few years before moving to this country in California and establishing a branch state, uh, stateside. Uh, you've actually been here from what I've been told to New Mexico in 2016. So that was before I ever started beekeeping. And you got to meet to uh, meet and present to beekeepers in both Albuquerque and Taos. And you're, you're currently based in Denver or California? Yes, I'm in Denver, Colorado Denver. now. Denver. And so um, uh, Quentin is in a bit of a transition, uh, sort of moving from or, or continuing on and joined a company called Alveole. Is that pronounced correctly? It's alveol. It means actually oh. a bee cell in French, the hexagon shape. Oh, wonder, wonderful. <laughs> alveol. See, I'm studying Spanish. And so I used to, anyway, <laughs> alveol. Uh, alveol is an urban beekeeping company whose goal is to make people fall in love with bees, build ecological awareness, and in time, more sustainable cities and food systems. And I know you're on this morning, so you can see that that is one of the themes of our conference. Uh, the work that John Lundgren's doing about um, regenerable farming. Anyway, Alveol, since their founding in 2013, they've put more than 100,000 people directly in touch with bees, creating a strong sense of connection to nature and cities. So Quentin's going to share with us today his presentation, Rooftop Beekeeping in Urban Environments. And, you know, I have to mention this because I'll get beat up if I don't, but I'm hoping you're going to say something about bees on the rooftop of Notre Dame. Don't worry, I made a slide specially for that. I figured okay. people would be interested. <laughs> Great, so welcome. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen to show my presentation. Um, quick second. Uh, Why do that, guys? Uh, as Stefan mentioned, I am from France, so I do have, one might say a wee bit of an accent. So of course, if you don't understand something I'm trying to say, uh, please say it in the chat and Stefan will let me know and I could repeat myself, but please don't hesitate. I won't be offended. I know what it is to be, uh, have an accent and be a foreigner in a country. And so I understand my English is not perfect, um, but thank you very much. Uh, it's been a long day, a lot of presentation. I hope to keep this one uh, pretty fun and pretty light. Um, today I'm going to present to you about rooftop beekeeping in urban environments. It's, uh, it's something that is not new, that, but it is trendy and it's exploding around the world. And I figured that it would be a good thing for you guys to hear, hear about it. So here we are. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about my story and where I come from in France and what we did there with my family. And then uh, talking a little bit about Alveol, the company, and what is what is urban beekeeping that we call so social beekeeping? Um, and what does that entail? There's some definitely some pros and some cons about doing beekeeping in the city, uh, especially you guys that are used to doing beekeeping out there in the countryside uh, or in a garden when you go on the rooftop that is 10 stories tall, tall you have some different uh, restriction, one might say, um, and the, the challenges that it just brings with it. Um, so my story, I cannot really start my my own story my my beekeeping story without talking about my dad my dad nicholas that some of you might know uh, is quite of a famous beekeeper in france he started when he was actually 15 years old um, at a boarding school that was this type of school where you stay all week or even a few weeks at a time and in france on wednesday afternoon you don't have class um, and so you can do soccer you can do they could do archery they could do many things and someone was doing beekeeping and so my dad started to learn with that person and just fell in love with this he just loved it and when he came back home he talked to his dad my grandfather and they decided to build hives and so they built and now it sounds kind of crazy to me but they built together when my dad was about 18 19 years old they built about 300 hives so that's bottom board 
the 3000 frame that go with it, plus the shallows, two shallow per hive, 600 shallows. So it was a lot of work. Uh, they didn't have much money, but they had a lot of time and uh, capacities, technique um, that they knew about how to work the wood. And so they created those hives. And my dad was doing markets. Um, he actually made a deal with the firefighter of the entire region, the, the county, if you will, um, where every time they see, they didn't want to deal with bees. So every time they had um, a, a swarm call, then they will call my dad and my dad would rush wherever he's from and um, and catch those bees. And so that's how before Bawa, you know, in the in the 80s and nine, early 90s, well, it was an easy way to, to keep many hives and to have more hives. Um, and so my dad did this until he was um, in his early 20s and then decided to, to go back to studying and get a, you know, quote unquote, regular job, student ties, uh, move up to Paris and around Paris and um, just had a consulting job. And then when he was uh, 40, I was about 12, 11 at that time. Um, he said, no more. He said, I, I, I don't want to be uh, working in a suit and a ties. I, I love the city and I love the bees and I want to bring this together. And so he bought a few nooks. Um, to give you a perspective, when we first started, I think he bought 12 nooks. Uh, and as a height of the company, they had probably about 12, 1300 um, colonies. So he grew quite fast in 10 years, uh, which in Europe is a, is a big number. I know nothing to impress American beekeeper, but in Europe, it's a fairly big number of hives. Um, and then, well, guess what? He had a son. He didn't have much money to pay an employee, but he had a son willing to do a lot of things. And so ended up working, you know, nights, weekend holidays with him and learning beekeeping along his side. Um, it was it was awesome. I'm not going to say it was fun every day. You know, when you're 16 and it's hot and you're sweaty and you're under a suit and you work from 6 a.m. to late at night and um I had other plan as a teenage, uh, all the things I wanted to do as a 16 years old during the weekends. But um, now I'm very grateful. Uh, it was it was hard work, and we just we just yeah worked together long alongside for a long time, which was which was very awesome. And I saw his company BLP grow from pretty much nothing to what it is what it was until a couple of years ago. And I'll come back to that. Uh, the funny story about the urban beekeeping with my dad is that everybody think, thought he. He, he had a big plan with putting those bees on the rooftop and things like that. The, the real reason why he did that is that he was trying to sell nooks for hobby beekeeper in the city. People, people mostly like, like you and, and the, the people you know around you that have one to hive in their garden. And uh, people just didn't really believe about it. Um, and so he decided to put a hive on a rooftop in Paris. Don't make the person pay for it, but just to prove that one, there was a little less VAWA pressure out there, that the honey quality uh, was amazing and the diversity of different honey that you find in it was was just astonishing um, and that the heavy metal um, kind of propaganda that was about city honey was just not true at least for Paris and so people hear about it heard about it and then journalists heard about it made an article and then phone calls and then from this it just snowball effect ended up that uh, he started kind of a business about it definitely not the first person to do that but he was one of the first, even the first to make a lot of noise about it. And this was about um, 10 years ago. Um, after, when I got about 18, 19 years old, right after graduating high school, I didn't really know what to do, like a lot of 18 years old. And so I decided to go to uh, travel around the world and learn more about beekeeping because for my dad, we had, we had a project in mind. And so I went to California for six months and then to, for two years, pretty much what I did is when North Hemisphere and South Hemisphere to just being all the time in season. And I was visiting different company from five, 6,000 hive down to a hundred hive people making queen, people only making pollinization, people only making honey as their primary focus of their business. And so it was just learning different technique. And so, uh, as you see on the screen, it was California, Argentina, Sicily, Malta, Greece, other places in France and in Europe, where I stayed just a small amount of time. Most of those, uh, all of these places that I listed here, I um, I stay at least for a few months up to California, where I stayed for six months. It was just an amazing experience. Got to learn languages, meet people, but also um, learn beekeeping, a different way of beekeeping. Because you know we are all beekeepers around the world, but our environment and the little tips and tricks that we use, the, the tiny little different, this one, five, 10% different that we do differently from everybody. Uh, this is what, what is so valuable. And 
I also understand that if I was taking 100% the, the way new beekeeping in, in Paris, a uh, fairly wet climate, um, continental and things like that, and trying to apply them exactly somewhere else in the world, well, it would not work. And so I went to, as I say, I don't know if it's a proper way, but uh, make my own sauce, make my own beekeeping. And so grab a lot from what I got in France from my dad and um, from all the all this other beekeeper, this other um this other you know be whisperer if you will um and, and um and i decided to apply that in california in the us so when i was after two years when i was 21 uh, i branched out the the family company biopic in california where we decided to do some pollination selling milk and honey um for about four years i was on my by myself on my own uh, doing this adventure that was uh, that was quite something there was a, a lot a lot a lot to learn uh, a lot of mistakes uh, a lot of good experience but um it was it was amazing overall and i it just you know building it from scratch understanding what are the us who what is california what is the barrier type of environment and the people there it was uh, it was quite amazing um and my dad joined me about two years ago with the rest of my family my mother and two two out of three of my siblings uh, came and moved to California as well, uh, which is pretty awesome. The reason for that, and that's where you're going to see that the BOP and Alveol story kind of intertwine, uh, is that uh, my father sold the company Biopic to Alveol. They um, Alveol integrated the company, and my dad joined the company and me as well to, you know, be part of that that new adventure. Uh, I will touch up on Alveol, you know, uh, towards the uh, towards uh, a little later in the presentation. Um, so yeah, five years in California. Um, the last year, that after four years just doing Biopic on my own, um, I decided to join Alveol, and uh, they were opening the city of San Francisco at that time. Uh, good luck or bad luck, we actually opened that uh, office uh, among 10 other cities in the US that year, two years ago, uh, a week before the official you know, COVID restrictions started in California. So. It brought a lot of challenges, a lot of doubt and things like that, but overall we just um, made it and it was amazing. And so after a year, um, so last year in April, I decided to move to Denver, Colorado. The reason is that Alveo was opening Denver at that time and I wanted to see more of the US and also the challenge was bigger. The goal over there was to do um, a centralized extraction to bring all of our honey from different places in the US, from our cities to bring it and extract it all in uh, in Denver, so I decided to um, follow Alveo in this new story, let's say. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about beekeeping in Paris and beekeeping in France, rooftop beekeeping. Um, the funny part is, you know, we hear a lot of people uh, saying how crazy we are to put bees in the city and how dangerous and, and things like that. And, and, and for us, there's a lot of people that just kind of got disconnected with nature. Uh, beekeeping is, uh, is not something new and beekeeping the city is not something new, you know, as a generation before hers used to have a cow or goat or chickens and they used to have hives because that was the best way to get some medicine and some sugar, some sweets to be able to cook with. Um, and so actually the, the funny part is that we estimate that uh, up until Napoleon's uh, in France, I think it's Napoleon III, um, kind of forbid beekeeping uh, on the rooftop and in the city of Paris. The, the goal was, quote unquote, to industrialize the, 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 the city. And, and there was just a lot more hive at that time. We estimate about 10 more time, 10 times more hives in the city of Paris than they, there is today. Um, and he decided to just push the people. And so the goal was to make the city, you know, more industrialized, more about service than the, than the primary sector and push the agriculture like many other countries have done, push the agriculture towards, more towards the country, uh, be pet people specialized on the primary um, uh, sector out there and in a different type of business and economy in the city. So it was, it was, uh, it was not very different. Um, what else there is here? So we started in 2012. I touched a little bit about there, but I want just for you guys to have the date. Uh, if we talk a little bit more about the beekeeping, the, the way we manage hive in Paris, uh, as I mentioned, we it seems to be a two to three degrees Celsius a little higher in the city of Paris than it is outside of Paris. So the advantage for that is that um, in general, the bees are able to start brooding up, the colony is brooding up a little earlier in the season, which is awesome. And we have seen uh, that they're able to also uh, keep the amount of vowel or lower 
I'm not really able to explain that. We have a, we have a theory, well, I'm gonna talk more about it, but um, in general, the hive seems to do a little better out there. Uh, we run Dayton Hive, so Dayton, I'm sure you know, but um, similar, same, but different than, uh, than length thought. They're just a little bigger, pretty much. Um, there's always fight about who, which one is better. I've tried both, uh, they're both awesome in their own. Uh, both have pros and cons, but yeah, that's what we run, Dayton Hives. 10 frame uh, and we run shallows with them. And this is gonna matter later on uh, in this discussion. But yeah, we run shallows, nine frame shallows on top of the hive and then two or three shallows for them. Um, one thing that uh, we always had an advantage for doing the beekeeping in Paris and around is that because Biopic at that time was also selling splits, we're selling a lot of brood. And so basically the idea is that we've seen um and of course i won't say name but a lot of beekeepers especially in the us that keep frame for a very long time being plastic foundation and they'll i've seen some not necessarily plastic foundation but stay for 20 30 plus years and the problem is um that seems like the wax frame are holding a lot of disease chemicals and things like that that cause a lot of problem for the bees well we had the advantage that we consider that we're able to replace 100% of our frame every two to three years. Basically, the idea is that we're using cap brood to sell um, to the, the customer, the hobby beekeeper. So we're removing cap brood from the hive, introducing new foundation in there. You also have the advantage that, as you can expect, the biggest one of the biggest worry that we have in urban beekeeping is swarming. Uh, beekeeping and nature is fun in the cities until people call you and freak out because there's 50,000 bees uh, flying all around New York City or Paris. So swarming is something that we really, really, really try to avoid. Um, and so by removing frame of brood, we lower down the, the we, we don't change the dynamics so much of the hive, we just lower down their population as simple as that. And so that's kind of prevent the swarming. And so that there's no swarming in the cities. And one, we get to remove some bower pressure from a hive without doing treatment by removing a lot of this cap brood. Uh, and the second and last one is that every two to three years, we are able to replace 100% of the frame out there. Uh, so that was a huge, huge advantage for us. So the hive are quote unquote, very clean constantly. Uh, so the way we replace the frame, it's that, uh, just to give you guys a little more a visual about that, is that 50%, we replace 50% of the frame once a year, pretty much. Um, one treatment a year. That's something also that uh, I know my dad was very proud of. Uh, we ended up in Paris being able to do only one treatment a year. Uh, we used to do two. Uh, there was one uh, APVAR treatment right after the, 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 the harvest in, at the end of July. And, um, and one oxalic treatment right around Christmas, between Christmas and New Year. We usually visit every single one of the hive. And we do um, um, uh, oxalic treatment via drip. Um, and we realized pretty quickly after two to three years that it was just not necessary to use the AP bar anymore, that the hive stayed clean enough and in very good health that we didn't knew, need to do two treatment a year and especially to use uh, the, the, the AP bar that, you know, Vawa seems to get more and more used to, uh, which they, they don't with the oxalic acid. And since we had so little amount of brood at that time, that were allowing us to just knock down all the Vawa at the lowest lowest point of the season, and then they could have start fresh and clean at that time. So that was that was a big big victory uh, for doing this. A, a quick um, a little fun story about uh, the oxalic and the difference between two country uh, is that um, I always been we've always been amazed here in the U.S. In the U.S., you can buy oxalic acid from Amazon and it gets delivered to your door. Um, in France, oxalic acid is actually considered an acid as it is, and so it's a restricted material. So you can only get it at pharmacies. And so what we're doing is that we're dropping little, um, you know, those little brownish bottles that the pharmacists use, um, or like for doing air mixture and things like that, like oil. Uh, and so we're dropping these one per hive and two per hive actually. And then the pharmacist will drop the exact measurement of acid because we're not allowed to manipulate it. And then we'll take them back when the pharmacist filled it up and then we're pouring some warm syrup into it and then dripping it on the hive. So it's much more complicated process and much more expensive. Um, I'm gonna keep going to uh, what everybody is wondering about, which is Notre Dame. Um, Notre Dame, what a, what a crazy time it was. Um, so it's the 15th of April, 2019. 
Um, you know, my dad got quite famous by putting bees around uh, Paris and some monuments, some places that were well known. Uh, one thing that he always was very, very attached to do is putting hives at Notre Dame. The reason is that it's such a strong uh, history between um, Catholic and the, 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 the bees and the development of the meat and the wax and all of the things and research that we've done um, for the beekeeping. So for him, it was a big pride of doing this. And let's be honest, also, like it is the dead center of Paris. It is more than well known around the world. And so he knew that the exposure will be quite great. Uh, so those hive have been there for quite a bit of time. Uh, you can see in the bottom picture, um, this is actually myself, you can see in the bottom picture the we are on the we are on the south side. So the door is facing the west side, is it in this tiny island? in the dead center of Paris, actually right in front of the church, uh, the cathedral, there is uh, the, the point zero marker of Paris. This is still considered the center of Paris. It's in the plaza right in front of the cathedral. Um, and so the hives are not per se exactly on the church. Uh, they are on the building right, attached right next to it. That's where the, 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 the priest and the people taking care of the church used to stay. Uh, of course, now they've been transformed offices for people that work at the church. Uh, so the hives are right next to it. And um, so this fire started in the 15th of April, 2019. And it was a crazy time. Um, we don't need to worry about necessarily what happened, but basically the roof took in fire, the entire roof of the cathedral. But because it is France and those building are hundreds of years old, well, they're not made out of wood, but they're made out of stone. And stone, the stone of the screen is probably not big enough. Um, the stone of the cathedral is something sometimes three to four feet thick, and it's pure stone blocks that are there. So what happened is that the hives on the side, you have the, the, the cathedral, um, the, the, the cathedral building and the rooftop took on fire, the massive beam as well, and all of this melted and fell down. But the wall, because they have stone, did not burn down. And what was crazy, because they're so thick that the hives were about maybe 150, give or take 150 feet, 100 feet from the fire, but they were a little lower. And because of the stone walls, well, the hive were, did not burn in fire. We of course didn't um, knew that at the time. So when we learned about the fire, I was in California at that time. So many people called me about it, uh, even uh, uh, reporter, journalist, and things like that. Uh, I got a, a, a fun interview with NPR that called me with, from All Things Considered. They asked me about it, uh, but it was a highly restricted area, as you can assume. It's a, it's a very sensible site in Paris and for France, so it was completely protected. And when my dad say, well. I have hundreds of thousands of bees on that roof. They're like, no way, you don't get a pass. So I remember him, we're on the phone all day, all night, uh, looking at news feed and things like that, trying to get satellite image because you had the satellite, you had the helicopter, you had anybody that will come by. And so the news feed for two, three days, it was crazy trying to see if the hives had burned down. At that time, we didn't know. Um, what we're looking for, to be honest, as if some of you have seen when hive get too hot, well, it was just like a cascade of wax in front of the hive that we could see from the image. Because at that time we didn't know and we knew it was a better time. The fire was not completely out. If they were still alive, we should move them. Um, and so we could not get there. And finally, I think after three, three and a half days, um, we got the authorization to go there. And uh, it was amazing. The bees that survived, they were doing absolutely perfect. We know that the melting point of the wax is very, very low compared to many other material. And bees were fine, did not have a mark of either the smoke or the wax or anything like that, uh, which was quite fantastic. It was quite of a story. There, was, there were three hive at a time out there uh, and they all survived and made it crazy well. And it was amazing. Uh, the honey was extracted that year in 2019. Um, of course, it goes all back to the client, which is the church, and the church uh, auctioned it off to pay for to to raise some money to be able to uh, to pay for a new roof and rehabilitate the church. Checking if I'm still on time. So this is the story of Notre Dame. It was uh, it was quite amazing. Uh, offered a lot of publicity and a lot of sensibilization about for people about like what is what is going on, on the rooftop a lot of people had no idea at that time still that there were bees in in paris and so that gave us a good platform a good bridge to be able to reach out to these people and, and tell them what was going on and uh, usually it's an easier way when you tell people not like 
hey, I'm putting bees, but more like, hey, you're living near and you're constantly living near hundreds of hives around you and you're doing fine. So maybe they're not the problem. Uh, and so people usually kind of soothe in and, and ease into the idea of like the beekeeping, the urban beekeeping. So let's keep going. And so now we're going to talk about Alville. Uh, it's an urban beekeeping company. Alville was created um, in Montreal, 2013, as Stefan said. Now um, it was from three person, uh, knew each other from college and decided to, to create this adventure to to, the goal was to connect, reconnect people with nature. And so they brought, uh, one of them, his uncle is a big beekeeper in Manitoba in Canada. And so they decided to get a few hives, do some backyard beekeeping, rooftop beekeeping, it just exploded. Um, I think I should say something very important about our is that um, we uh, never say that we're here to save the bees. And every time someone might, might label us as you know trying to save the bees or save the plant things like that we will always back up from that because this is not very much what, this is not at all what we pretend to do what we pretend to do is uh to connect to reconnect people with nature to show them you know this this separation that happened uh, a few decades uh centuries ago uh about this is there's people in the cities there's people in the country and they're different and you have to have one job and one expertise and things like that well that might not be the truth you know the reality here's the reality here's what's going on and one doesn't cancel the other one doesn't have to outweigh the other they can live all together and that's very much like the goal that we are trying to give to people is to connect them to their nature uh and to 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 make them understand what's going on we are uh, i like to tell my to to tell people about myself and it's easy as being french that i'm here to be a translator i'm here to show them what's going on in the hive and show them the beauty of nature that that exists around them they're just maybe not uh not able to understand it to 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 hear it they can hear it, they cannot listen to it so here's what we are for um Alvio, as of today in 2022 is now in two continents um so north america and europe seven countries so there is um united states canada belgium london uh belgium england France, Netherlands, and Germany, and 38 cities, um, which is quite crazy. The reason is, that I'm saying that is you're going to see for the management of beekeeping, so, so, so many different climates and uh, type environment, it's a, it's a crazy thing. So we have also above 100 plus beekeepers, so every beekeeper in the city. Uh, in each one of the cities, there's several beekeepers taking care of about 30, 40, uh, up to 60 hives on the rooftop and around. Um, usually on each site, we do not put more than one to two hives uh, just for the safety of the people. And the goal, you know, is not to, to, to once again, to harvest or make pounds and tons of honey. The goal is very much to give people this experience about beekeeping and nature around them. Beekeeping, urban beekeeping, be, before anything, this is social beekeeping. Once again, um, beekeepers can be here for doing pollination, for doing splits, for doing honey, for harvesting propolis or things like that. Well, that's not our goal. That's things that sometimes we do, making honey we do with every hive, but the, very much the goal is to bring people to the hive. So every time we visit a hive, we never, never to rarely wear a veil. Uh, we always have a smoker and a hive tool and the people, we don't encourage them to wear a veil. We, we use some type of bees that are very docile uh, and, and so very much the goal is to, to have it accessible. We want it to be an engagement for the people. We want them, the, the people to see what is going on inside the hive. So we always try to put them on, on sites where people can come close to the hive because if it's a, on a rooftop, on a corner or things like that, and people cannot see it, cannot touch it, cannot experience it, where well, we kind of lose the value of it. Um, you know, they, it's as good as a documentary saying like, oh, this is what's going on out there, but you cannot touch it. We want people to experience it. So we have what we call the frame moment when we get to give people, um, give people a frame of bees. You know, when you've never been near a hive, it's quite impressive already and you don't wear a veil and someone is holding a frame and then hand it to you and then you get to hold on to this frame. Uh, it's just a fantastic experience, try the honey and things like that. So this is very much why we're trying to do is uh, reach out to these people in direct to impact them and, and show them the beauty of nature and beekeeping around them. 
Um, oh, that's a very blurry picture. I'm sorry. Yeah, I assume that he, he was much better before that. But um, here's the, the, the beekeeping around, um, around the city. Um, yeah, there's a lot of pros and a lot of cons. Not that many cons, but there's definitely challenges, let's say. Let's call them about urban beekeeping. Um, you know, a, a working company where a beekeeper is in charge, as I, as I said, of 800, 1200 hive per beekeeper, what I'll build, it's about 60 hive because you can imagine every beekeeper, they spend a day on the road in city in traffic in their little van and then they go visit five, six, at most eight hive in a day. Uh, they go up and down and you got to talk to security and the property manager and go talk to people and go up there, carry your equipment through hatches. Uh, sometimes, as you can see in the bottom picture, you even have to uh, harness yourself to be able because the, the hole on the roof there might, might be big enough for a person, but not for all the equipment. So you have to, to pull it through, um, uh, on the side of the building. So it is pretty crazy experience uh, and pretty crazy challenges. Uh, the first one is the height. Um, you know, building can get very, very high in the city. We try to limit it, um, the amount of... Um, stories are high we put our hives uh, usually we try to not go above 10 to 12 stories uh, sometimes it's a little more it depends you know the bees are going to tell us sometimes i've seen bees at 30 plus stories doing amazing and sometimes 10 stories is too much for a colony it mostly depends on the wind uh, in a lot of uh, of cities and big cities around the world because of all those building you have wind corridor so from one building to another 500 feet away um, it might be a complete different experience. So a complete different environment might be much more humid or shady constantly or very, very windy. Um, and so the bees will tell us definitely if it's a good place or no. If it's not, we'll just find a better place for those hives uh, to do that. But height is, um, is a challenge. It's also a challenge for a beekeeper. I was going to talk a little more about access, but, um, you know, in general, it takes me about an hour uh, door to door to go up and down a building uh, and do my beekeeping management. The reason is uh, you park, sometimes you have to find parking, call, talk to security, um, go up, you have elevator, then stairs and a hatch, and then you carry all your equipment, you take care of the hive, you talk to the people, take pictures, take videos, uh, and then have to do it all again. So that makes it very, very challenging sometimes, uh, but this is also the fun, fun of it. Um, and other things, because now my job at Alveo, I can tell you about that, is a beekeeping field specialist. So I help develop uh, and create the, the beekeeping management over the entire United States for all the cities that we have around here. Uh, and it is pretty challenging. Um, to give you an example, the coldest temperature that we have in Alveo city is probably in Quebec City. Uh, it's a little north of Montreal. In the winter, it gets commonly down to minus 40 Fahrenheit for many, many days and many, many nights, uh, which is quite insane. And then we have Houston, Texas, you know, probably Dallas is hotter, Dallas, Texas. We have uh, LA as well, where it gets well above 110 for many, many days also in the summer. So, you know, it's so hard for a beekeeper, myself included, to understand your environment. And, and it takes some time to master it, if we ever can, as well, of course. And, and, and now with Alveo, we, we, we are trying to play with all those bits um, and, and all those data to be able to manage those hive in very, very different environment. As it says here, there's more than 10 climate, different type of climate where we keep our hive. So it is very challenging, but also amazing to be able to adapt and find all those little tips and tricks to, um, to, to just better ourselves and better our management of the hive. Uh, so this is, this is quite amazing. Um, yeah, all different type of temperature of bees, of, of challenges according to the city and the climate. Um, at Alveo, we run length of 10 frame. Uh, the reason for that is that the equipment, you know, it's the most common in the US. The equipment is not too big. It's also make it such an ease for us to be able to um, interchange the frame uh, between the top box and the bottom box and to be able to do the honey harvest and having only one type of equipment. So that's why we choose those length of 10 frames. Um, uh, after a little, uh, in a few slides, you'll see a couple of pictures of uh, alveol hives. Um, the reason I talk about access, but the reason also for that is that, you know, we have probably in the US right now, well, the entire alveol company, probably over 4,000 hives. Um, 
across many, many cities. So it brings a lot of challenges. So we usually, and because of urban beekeeping, because imagine carrying a 50, 40, 40 pound, 60 pound boxes of honey on, on, on 20 stories down on stairs and hatches and things that make it pretty complicated. So we decided to limit ourselves to one harvest a year. This harvest doesn't happen at the same time in every city. It happens at a different time according to their environment. But all of those honey frames uh, come here to Denver and then we extract them separately. We do micro batches. So we extract each frame, another challenge, the beauty of it. We extract each, for each frame in its own bucket for, its, for their clients. So the goal is that we don't mix the Denver honey. Now we do each hive is one little batch. And then that batch go in the bucket and this bucket we jar it. And when we give back a hundred jars to the clients uh, to be able to, for them to have a hyper local honey, you know, it's part of it. Like we're trying to connect them to nature, holding the bees, seeing the bees every day. That's one part of it. The second part of it is having the honey that is hyper local. You know, how, how proud you are when you grow a couple of tomatoes in your garden, uh, same stuff with your honey. It's not like a random honey from Walmart or even better from the, from the farmer's market. No, it's the honey from up on the roof, the place where I'm going five days a week. And so people love that. Um, and so it's quite amazing the response that we have from that. But for us beekeeper on the back end, it makes it a little more complicated because now we have 4,000 batches to do. It's not anymore, you know, per city, per region, per whatever. It is every single client. Um, we get a mark box for their frame of honey. And then we extract and do a small batch, a particular birch batch per, um, Pair hives, so that's very very challenging. Um, at Alveo, we do also uh, one to two treatment per year, depending on what city we are in. Um, as Dr. Ramsey say, um, uh, and encourage people to treat. You know, we uh, we definitely do that, and we do a lot of sugar shake. I'm very adamant about it uh, to be able to see, just be aware about the amount of power that we have. Um, Maybe we should start giving our numbers to Marla. That will be pretty interesting. But yeah, we get we get a lot of data from many many places in the country, many continent these two continents, so that help us being able to monitor the power pressure and take the best educated decision that we can. Um, so we do one two treatment per year. Usually there is one right after the harvest uh, and one either early in the winter or after the winter to start the spring fresh. So this is usually the two different type of treatment that we do. Um, here I'm going to show you a few pictures um, of urban beekeeping. This is in Montreal. Uh, you can see this is the, the alveol 10 frame boxes uh, that a beekeeper is, is inspecting. Uh, so you see it's uh, some challenges. Uh, there's a lot of things on that roof, a lot, a lot of things to consider when you're moving around, what you can bring, what you cannot, and things like that. Um, here's another one. This is in Toronto, people inspecting a frame of honey. Um, here's the same beekeeper in Montreal, so you can see little dolly, you have to go up and down and load the things, uh, load, load those hives, break them into nook to be able to go through hatches and then we put them together. Uh, lucky us, we don't move our bees as often as pollinator and migrator beekeeper, migrator beekeeper, but we do move our hive and so it gets pretty complicated sometimes. This is myself in San Francisco, I'm carrying a hive. Um, so. Yeah, that was, uh, that was during COVID last year. And here's in Philly. Uh, so this is your typical like alveol boxes, 10 frame length thought. Uh, we use inner cover as well. Let me know guys, I'm not looking at the chat. If you want me to show more the pictures. Um, and so now I know we're a little early, but I really like to answer question. I really like to be able to interact with you guys. You know, we've been beekeeping and beekeeping is so broad, um, but um, I would love to talk to you and show you, go back in my slides if you want to, you know, uh, go deeper in whatever subject you would like. Quentin, that's amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, um, you know, as I mentioned, it was hard to find you. We finally found you and now we know where to find you in the future. So it's going to be so awesome. interesting to watch this story as it continues. And, you know, when you're in Denver, you're pretty darn close to Albuquerque. So yeah. we might be able to get you down to see us. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
So, you know, as the host, I do have the privilege of getting to, <laughs> to ask the first question, the most questions and the last question. But um, I just I just wanted to say I find it remarkable that um, you're, you know, beekeepers, we all love to bring people to our hives, many of them for the first time. Uh, but we always put them in, I mean, we always put them in a suit because we don't want them to get stung. We don't necessarily know if they're allergic. And uh, they're all often very much afraid of bees. And so it's real curious. Could you share a little bit about, I, I you, you said something about, you know, you want people to really feel connected, but has it ever caused you any problems with people getting stung? It happened, it had happened, you know, let's be, let's be fully honest. It's very, very rare. I think one of the reasons that people are less afraid is that um, we are playing in, on their turf. We are bringing them, we are bringing the bees to them and not bringing them, you know, taking them from the city, bringing them outside of the city uh, where they don't live, where they don't hang out that much. We bring them on their place of work, on the rooftop. So they have their, their own clothes, the way they dress every day, and they come to a place where they're familiar. We don't force anybody. We always have a little hat veil available for, for people if they want to wear it. Some people do. And then as they get more comfortable throughout the hour, um, they usually take it off and come closer. Uh, we have never had anybody having a bad rea uh, allergic reaction. Uh, people rarely get stung. Uh, we also, you know, use a few techniques to be able to have the bees staying calm when we do our inspection and we make sure that every high is, ve is very, very gentle uh, that we bring up on the rooftop. But yeah, we do, you know, we have reached out to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people every single time we, you know, we go in those offices, we go in this low building lobby where there's maybe 3,000 people and invite people to come up with us and they just, they just love it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, do you ever, uh, Ann Atkinson has the question, do you, do you encounter any reluctance to placing hives from building owners or managers due to liability issues? Yes, of course. Um, it it, it happened constantly. You know, it's also the snowball effect now is that nobody want to be the first, especially when uh, big cities in the US, you don't want to be the first person and be famous for having a problem on your roof, having a problem in your building. But now we can use the reference of so many different stories, so many different clients, so it's easier and easier. Uh, usually our main customers are actually property manager. Uh, they are looking for amenities. They are looking for ways to engage the tenants and to kind of better their practices by being more envir environmentally friendly. So that's definitely the type of people that we're trying to target is this property manager. And so usually they really, really like having the bees. Uh, let's be honest, what happens 50% of the time is that we are usually away from the rest of the people, more on the roof and things like that. And as years go and every single time is the same thing. First year, we are as far as we can be, but we still bring people. And then second year, we're closer to the door. And then the third year, we're down on the park or down on the balcony where people understand that, okay, we want to try this project, but there's some liability to it. Uh, and so they want to protect themselves. So usually they go, they go very, um, they're very prude about it. And then as we go, the years go by, then we have, um, then we, we, we just get closer and closer to the people. That sounds very cool. So when a company or building uh, contracts with you to put these hives on the roof, are there locations where people that don't necessarily work for the company uh, could actually be invited to come up and see them as well? Or is it just for the employees of the company that is hosting? So it depends. Uh, most of the time, it's just for the companies um, sit, like that are renting spaces in this building, but we also try to go a lot in like community garden, parks, having cities be able to do this. Uh, and so down the road, more and more people come. And I'm able to do that in Denver. I'm working with um, the urban, Denver Urban Garden is one of the biggest uh, uh, American nonprofits for community garden. We're putting hives there that people sponsor and so for the community. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Julian Salinas says she just read an article that London is experiencing challenges with their urban bees because of a lack of resources available within the foraging diameter of the city. How do you know when you've reached carrying capacity for the bees? 
Um, so I've read this article actually, he, I think it was published not so long ago. Uh, this is an ongoing conversation that we, we need to have and we have constantly as, a, as people and as a company because um, the, how can I say that? The honeybees are not native from the US, uh, they are native from, they are in Europe and definitely in London. And there's a lot of native bees out there and here, but the bees are not native to that. Um, usually, um, how do we measure that? Is that we, we partner with nonprofit and with research to be able to measure this impact that we have. And we're trying to educate people about planting and made, making the nature in the cities more attractive to those pollinator and native bees and honeybees as well. And I think that's how we kind of uh, try to fight our battles is we don't try to be anti anything. We don't try to separate ourselves, but we believe that by connecting people with nature and being more aware of the honeybees, because the honeybees are essential. They are super important to the world and our environment, but they are not the only thing that are important. But if you think about the polar bear or the whales, when, when we talk about uh, the ice melting on the poles, we don't only want to save the polar bear, but we know about the polar bear. It was a, like a mascot. It was something that was a, easy for people to relate to and that bring people to be more aware and making different choices that benefit the entire environment around them and around those polar bear. And so that's what we see with the beehive as well uh, and the honeybees is that by educating people, um, we are going to be able to to, to have people that are more aware, more informed, more educated, and they can make better choices for their environments. Um, and so, yeah, that will be my two bits on that. Excellent. So a couple of questions that are kind of related, I'll just put the two of them together. Connie wants to know, do you work with root, rooftop garden clubs? And Marion says, we have a green roof on our city building and are thinking about putting hives there. Any tips on getting started? Um, so we do work with green roof. Of course, that's something that is pretty common to a beehive over there. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to, to make a promotion for, for this company, for Avil, but, uh, you know, look for companies around you, locals, non-locals, that can be helping you to put those hives. Um, I, I, will, I will say what also matters is that beekeeping is, uh, is something that requires quite a bit of knowledge and practice. So be careful with what service are the people offering. There's different ways. Some people sell the hive to the client and then the client pay for the service of servicing the hive, but now you own the hives. And so if you're not planning on taking care of the hive or you don't want to pay anymore, well, the hives are yours and they're going to stay on the roof. Uh, at our view, we're a little different about that. And I'm saying that laughing, but it's not that funny. I've seen many hives that just get abandoned or just people that end up to be like, well, I have two hives there, but I've never done beekeeping in my life and I'm not planning on taking care of them. So that's kind of put them in a little bit of a pickle. Uh, at our view, we own the hive and we place them there, but I'm sure around you, there's a, some other people that will be doing that as well. Okay, excellent. We have a couple of really good questions uh, still lined up. Um, do you see uh, any acidic pollution effects in any way health uh, affect the health of the bees or the quality of the honey? I think you touched on this, but could you just... Um, yeah, well. no, I think it's, it's important to say that. Uh, to be honest, I've heard it much less in the US, uh, but in France, there's always a big question about heavy metals um, that are done by lead and all the things, especially pollution of the cars. Um, and to be honest with you, there was also a study, I don't know if it has been published actually, about the Notre Dame fire and the smoke that he had uh, that affecting the plants and the honey in this area, because you could really see that smoke going away from Paris as the fire was burning. Um, so no, there's no heavy metals. There's nothing. Uh, there is traces of um, foreign agents that are not necessarily... Um, uh, that are, could be pretty harmful to humans, but never at quantities that can, that can be harmful to humans. And the thing is also, our answer to that is always like, well, let's look at what's going on with the country and the amount of insecticide and pesticide, because the pollution of the cars doesn't seem to affect the plants um, directly and the honey that the hives, are, the, the, the bees are collecting. But also the advantage of the city, if you look at it, is that 
um, cities don't use heavy pesticide. They don't use, they don't have the, the big permit for the very harmful and toxic one in general. They're pretty much, much more aware and more environmental friendly. And so they're careful about what they use. And also something that I usually add quote unquote is that most urban beekeep, urban farmers, must, myself included, uh, we're pretty bad and most, of them that use chemicals, they usually use them too late. And so there's less and less consequences on the bees directly. So the effect of city pollution is very minimal and not to a point that we've seen harmful to the bees, neither to us. All right, great answer. <laughs> we have a, a, a participant named Lori who actually remembers you from being here six years ago. Oh. He said, at, at that time, you were talking about raising German black bees and the struggles with making money. Are you still working with that project? Yes. Uh, so actually, it's it's um, the, the 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 bee that is originally in France, in the northern part of France and Germany, in the northern part of Germany is Apis mellifera mellifera. Uh, it's commonly known as the the black bee, um, and. and um, they have evolved in France and Germany, Northern Germany for so long. Um, they are rough, they are rustic. They have they have bees and colonies that have evolved in this environment. They, um, they, have, they were the most common type of colony until like 20 years ago in France. Uh, they are pretty mean, let's be honest. They defend their nest pretty well. Uh, no, nothing that we heard about the, you know, the, the, the Africanized bees or things like that, but they, they are just in general pretty mean hives, never grow brood up that much. They stay pretty small colony. They don't um, harvest a lot of honey. Uh, so they stay pretty small, um, pretty small colony, don't make a lot of honey. And since they're a little bit mean, well, they just kind of got abandoned by uh, the beekeepers in France, especially commercial beekeeper that wanted something that was more performant and could harvest more. As Marla was talking about this morning, you know, Propolis is quote unquote a pain for a lot of commercial beekeeper. Um, the 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 black bees was just not interesting, not producing enough, not 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 a good bee for them. So they stopped using it. And a researcher in France started to work with my dad before he met my dad, and then a lot with my dad to reintroduce that black bee. And so what they created in France is conservatory. So the way it goes is that uh, this this scientist is developing finding. Um, finding the, 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 the area in a city where we can introduce a few of these black bee genetic and then protected it by um, a, a county kind of, kind of law where you cannot be importing different type of genetic in that circle. So it's usually, how is it? It's, it's one, three, five, 15, 30 miles, I think. And there's more or less restriction into those circles. Uh, and then trying to, to, to bring back these honeybees and people love them. I mean, they're much easier to take care of. They fight Bauer really, really well. Uh, and they don't seem to, they, they seem now more, a little bit more to be able to, um, to produce honey. They resist really well for the winter. Funny story was that um, it's impossible to requin them. Well, I should not say impossible. It's very difficult to, they're very moody. They have a, a, a strong character, one might say. And so if you if you take some brood and then you pop a black queen in there and you try to raid them, they're not gonna make anything. So the, the funny story, what we're doing is that we're taking some Italian, the, the ligustica genetic that's much more gentle as everybody know, um, at least not the pure one. And so we're creating splits and introducing a black queen. And then we're waiting to brood cycle that all the Italian bees get replaced by only black bees. And then we're able to sell those splits, those nukes to people around. So yeah, it's a project that is still going strong. Uh, and so very interesting. I think conservation of, of genetic like this is very, very important because this is an endemic species. This is an endemic type of bees. They're very resistant and they're quite amazing. But uh, you don't go there without a veil. I, to, <laughs> to give another story, you know, uh, my grandpa has as, as a three, four hive in his garden. He actually funny, he lives when he, what he calls a, a swarm corridor. So there's always swarm coming on his property every single year. He lives about a couple hours south of Paris. So always has an empty hive and he gets filled up. And my grandpa, even, especially before Vawa, but even now with Vawa, like would not see his hive for a year or two, just doesn't do anything with them. And just whenever he doesn't have any more honey, just go and grab them, grab some honey and his hive just keep doing by themselves. Uh, which is, you know, it's a, 
unfortunately is getting more and more un unheard of uh, that we need to manage our hives otherwise they just keep having problem well the black bee seems to do pretty well but you can't ask them too much otherwise that's going to be a problem that's excellent i'm so glad we had that question from um, <laughs> from the participant interesting story so speaking of moody angry bees you know here in new mexico at certain latitudes uh, the africanized bees have moved into the southern part of our state so uh, do you limit your activities to locations above that latitude? Can you repeat the question, the end part? Sure. Well, because of the fact that be um, below a certain latitude, we do see the introduction of Africanized bees. And so, for example, here in New Mexico, a lot of our southern uh, New Mexico beekeepers, they deal with, uh, they have Africanized colonies or colonies that tend to be Africanized, and they know how to deal with them. And so I'm just wondering in, in, your, loca in your travels with Eviol around the, the, the country and the planet, uh, do you have to limit your activities to be above the latitude at which you see Africanized bees? As of right now, it hasn't been a problem. Uh, the, the lowest we go is uh, San Diego, which has some cases of it, but we haven't encountered it. We try to we visit our hive every three weeks um, and we try to keep the same genetic so if we see that there's any problem, any, any risk for the client or for the beekeeper, we remove the hives. To be honest, it hasn't been much of a problem, but once again, by I think moni monitoring closely our hives and our queens, we are able to manage this risk, at least to having them take over our hive for now. And I hope it will stay the same. Yeah. It isn't a problem for now, at least. Okay, so we just have a few more questions. Melanie, Melanie Kirby, who I think you know, I she wants so. to know, she says, as the Aviol company is in so many places and continues to expand, are there efforts within the management plan for each location to utilize bees that are acclimated to those areas? She says, European countries have their endemic strains, but here in the US and Canada, bees are moved so much. How do you decide which bees to use? So, um, great question, Melanie. I was not expecting less from you. Uh, this is, uh, yes, we, we, we do work and try to work more and more with local beekeepers and local breeders. That's definitely uh, something essential for us because we can try, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and if there's some time of, uh, of, of colonies of genetic that are just so doing so well and so accl acclimated to a certain area, why should not we use them? Uh, so this is something that we do. We are not perfect with it, to be honest, because right now, um, the, the, not everywhere we can do this, I will say. As we grow, we're going to be more and more able to do that. But usually we have small amount of, of, of bees concentration in one city as we grow throughout the year. But you know, in a place like Montreal, we have over six to 800 hives. So we're able to order more queens and guaranteeing timing and things like that from the breeder. But that's definitely the goal. And uh, I'm working, this is part of my job this year and hopefully the next one as well, to be able to find those breeders and find those genetic that are viable in an environment. Excellent. Hey, so I had a question that I wrote down and I almost forgot to ask you, but you know, when I was um, a brand new beekeeper, I started with one hive. And one of the things I was taught very early was you really don't ever want to have just one hive. You want to have two for multiple reasons. And so I was, it was curious to me to see that you did note that in some locations, you just go with a single hive. So that, um, well, yes and no. We do have a single hive in a location, but also consider that we have some hive in a yard in that city. So the idea of having two, two hive or at least in a location, or if you're a, a starting beekeeper, is that you can one compare them and understand yeah. if it's a general environmental or foreign problem, or maybe one colony is not doing well. My, whatever you can you can figure it out and you can support they can support each other usually you have a good one and a bad one like two tomato plants you water them in the same way but one is doing great one is not doing as well so that that's usually help you a lot to understand beekeeping and having a better support for your hive by having at least two hive in your garden the things for us is that we're trying to limit just for safety to one to two hive on the rooftop but you know a city like denver have about um 
40 hive on rooftop and have about 20 in the yard. So if I see, I go visit a hive and it's queenless, well, I'm gonna bring it down and then bring a new hive up there. If I see they're lacking a little bit of brood or resources or whatever they might need, well, I can take from the yard and then bring it up on the roof. So that's, we don't always have two hive on a location, but we have all the colonies to support that then. Okay, excellent. Hey, so um, I thought we would make it through the whole conference, the, the entire eight hours, without a question about the giant Asian murder hornet. <laughs> but we're going to end the day with a question uh, for you. Any challenges uh, with the Asian hornet? Well, so two of our cities, uh, three of our cities, Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver, uh, add you know, the, the scare of the giant um, Asian hornet out there last year. We haven't seen anything. Uh, he hasn't been a problem. I come from a place where, um, I guess I'll twist the, answer, the question in a different way. You know, in Europe, we have the common hornet. Uh, it's probably as big as my thumb. Uh, it feels like you're getting the biggest kick in of your life if you get stung by one of them. It's very, very painful, but they are not that aggressive, to be honest. They do bother the hive, but with those endemic species, there's this, this um, as Dr. Ramsey was, was saying, I think this, this biosymbiosis that like the idea of like, they are natural predator. So they come and do eat some bees sometime and destroy some colonies, but it's pretty minimal. The bees ball them up, kill them, and then that's it. And they have learned, um, they have learned because they also have predators like birds and things like that. So they have learned to evolve together. Um, about four to five years ago, a little more than that, maybe eight, the, actually, we had an uh, Asian hornet that came from container, we believe, in the Mediterranean Sea in the city of Marseille, one of the biggest cities in the south of France. And uh, they arrived in France, and now they are a terrible, terrible problem that we have in France because they're very voracious. They are stealing nests from all the hornets, uh, and they don't seem to have any predator, at least in France, nothing serious enough to control their population. It's a problem for beekeepers. Beekeepers have observed, and we have observed that as well, that you can be in a yard with 40 hives and you see the bees at the entrance, the forager, and they stop coming out and you're just worried because these hornets that are waiting for them and as soon as a forager come out, they just snatch them and kill them. So that's a big problem. Uh, we have used traps and things like that to kill them. Um, different tribe that works, but yeah, they, they are a big problem in France for sure. Um, and we don't really know what to do. We, I'm fairly hopeful and I, you know, I have a lot of trust in nature in general and evolution that we have quote unquote a foreign object, a foreign beings that is coming in an environment, doesn't have a predator. It's a huge problem because there's some unbalance in this environment. And as the year is gonna go back, the balance is gonna come to, together and, and we just balance itself. I think predator are gonna come and they are not gonna be able to survive to some condition and so that should be fine. But in France, we find them in a lot of places. Um, couple of things for you guys. Um, my dad went to Korea, meeted some beekeeper for the Happy Monday in Korea. Um, one thing that they do that seems horribly barbaric, but it's a pretty efficient because they do have many different types of hornets over there uh, that are a big problem for their beekeeping is that they will catch them. And he has a video of it. They will catch them, they grab them with tweezers they're bigger than my thought they're massive hornets and what they do is they cut their front legs um, and they dip them in insecticide and then they release them and so the hornet not being able to brush itself and clean itself from insecticide feel that there's a problem and it go back right inside the hive and so what they do is that they catch a few of those hornets dip them in the insecticide and release them they go in the nest and they just spread this insecticide everywhere in the nest and hopefully kill the queen in the rest of the nest. Because like was yellow jacket, hornet, if you catch whatever is in your yard, well, you're only catching the forager, the, the, the scaled ones. You're not catching, reducing the problem. You're just maybe lowering down the dynamics, slowing down, but you're not helping that much. Um, so that's one technique. In France, they're also very carnivorous. So people will dip an entire steak with insecticide you can put it right on the hive the bees will not be interested about a, a meat steak but the hornet will go for it and that will kill them uh those are pretty pretty barbaric but that's effective way of getting rid of them uh, another way simply put some reducer in your hives and that prevent them from going inside that's um pretty amazing i'm trying to think about <laughs> what kind what what cut of steak we're going to put <laughs> yeah no filet mignon no so, 
Listen, I, I must say that um, the thing that I've enjoyed most about this, this conference, including your presentation today, Quentin, is the fact that so many of our speakers know each other, they've spent time with each other, they work with each other. And let me tell you, I just got a, an email from Marla Spivak. She wants your contact information. So she's gonna be calling you. It just, uh, it warms, warms my heart to know that you guys um, are all working together to make this world a better place. And um, yeah, so thank I you love so Marla. She actually invited me years ago uh, before I came to New Mexico to do a talk for the Minnesota and Wisconsin Beekeeper Association. So another beekeeper from France, Sibyl came and we did and Marla received us um, amazingly well. And we got to see all of the different projects. And um, I remember Crazy Garden, Marla had, um, got some problem with her. I didn't know at the time that was such a big deal, but the HOA, I think, because she was growing a wild garden with native plants and native flowers all around in front of her house. And she was kind of fighting everybody to be able yeah. to grow yeah. that and not having a, a lawn and some right. grass. And so it was very That's funny. Right. And I thought that was quite amazing. That's awesome. Well, thank you for being part of a spectacular set of speakers. We're so glad to know you and we know how to get in touch with you and we'll be back in touch with you for future future conferences. Good luck with Aviol. Good luck. And, um, you know, we're not that far. So there are some rooftops in Albuquerque. I will come visit you guys. <laughs> thank you very awesome. much. Thank you so much.